This episode is brought to you by Skillshare. You can use my discount code in the description below to get two free months of learning on this awesome website. It's also brought to you by my supporters on Patreon. If you'd like to get access to the archive of live streams, extended tutorials, or private lessons, consider signing up there. This week, I want to discuss how we can use shape and light to indicate texture and materials. In order to do this, we should begin to incorporate methods of drawing that don't just depend on utilizing three-dimensional forms, but instead two-dimensional shapes that work together to create our subject. It's particularly useful to think this way when drawing from observation. I can use reference points, like the negative shapes that are created with the edges of the canvas to help orient myself. For example, this bottom triangle on the jaw is about a third of the way up and about one-fifth across. These shapes that I'm identifying result from differences in light and value. In addition to breaking my subject down into simple shapes, I'll also simplify the value structure. This is useful for you as the artist for several reasons. One, it makes your job easier and less time consuming. And two, grouping values together will always look nicer than trying to capture every gradation in shade. So right now, I'm sketching in the shapes that I see in the image. I start with the two semicircles that are created by the eye socket. We'll see later that we can use these as ellipses for identifying our perspective when we place our subject in a different angle. Now I'm duplicating over this shapely sketch and adding in those grouped values that I mentioned earlier. You'll start to see that these two techniques performed in conjunction produce an image that looks pretty good and similar to your reference image. And although I probably don't emphasize it enough on this channel, this is a really important skill that's worth developing because it'll strongly hone your intuition when it comes to drawing. Drawing in this way is also a pretty good introduction to painting, since this is how painters typically view their subjects. We start by identifying large shapes, and then gradually increase our resolution to pick up some of the smaller shapes of light and dark. However, when it comes to placing my subject at different angles, I have to resort to using primitive forms. But primitive forms alone won't make your drawing resemble the subject, nor will it give it interesting mark making. So I can combine all of these techniques together, creating an image that resembles the subject at a different angle. I use my forms to figure out where my shapes will be placed, and then the two-dimensional shapes of light and dark to make the drawing resemble the subject. Now this does require you to understand how curves and shapes transform at various angles in perspective, which I cover a lot in my Gumroad videos, and in a few of my YouTube videos as well. But to be honest, the best way at getting better at this is just practice and mileage. One example I'll point out though of the shapes transforming in perspective are the two circular eye sockets. Since those eye sockets are set at an angle, we can imagine both of them as tilted ellipses. When we elevate the camera overhead looking down, the degree of those ellipses is going to increase, making them look more circular. In addition to this, knowing the angle and height of my light source allows me to figure out some of those shapes of light and dark. Unless I'm trying to use cinematic lighting, which I'll cover in a future video, I tend to default to a 1-2-3 read. That's created when a light source is shining from one side, creating three distinct values on each visible plane of a cube. The other consideration we need to take into account is where our cast shadows will be projected to. You can refer to Scott Robertson's How to Render or my video on the topic for a refresher. To find where a shadow will be projected to, create shadow direction lines indicating from ground plane vertices. These will travel away from your light source, so if your light is on the left, these lines will go to the right. To find how far the shadow will go, we create angle of light lines that intersect both the upper vertices and the shadow direction line. If the light is high in the horizon, like noontime, the angle will be sharp and the shadow close. The opposite will be true for evening light, which is low in the horizon. When assigning values, remember that planes that are perpendicular to the light source will be the brightest, and planes that are parallel will be much darker. When it comes to texturing a subject, remember that there's more than one way to indicate a particular texture. I usually start by taking a look at a photo and then identifying some features about it. In the case of bark, we see that they have these long, thin strips each with their own three planes in volume. 
In between each of these strips we see dark cast shadows, and some of them are even coming off the tree itself. Now to practice creating this texture, I'm going to create another cube with a 1-2-3 read, so the light source will be coming from top left. While you don't have to use the same exact scheme, I like to start off by indicating the shape, and then adding tone by using vertical hatching. I add cast shadows that are oriented towards the bottom right. On the three side of my cube, I'll use denser hatching that's darker in value to show that it's in shadow. But since each piece of bark has its own three planes, I make sure to leave a highlight on those front facing planes. As a stylistic preference, I tend to strip the top plane or one side of most of its detail, just indicating certain shapes. Now I'll repeat the same process for lizard scales. Make observations about your subject, like in this case, the size of each scale decreases gradually as it travels away from the largest scale. Again, those front-facing planes on the three side have to catch a little bit of that light. This helps demonstrate that the surface is raised, and in conjunction with those strong cast shadows, it's really obvious to see how this surface would feel. For the sheep's wool, I'm going to use a different mark making technique to indicate my value. Since the tufts of wool have a lot of volume to them, I'll use lines that wrap around the form. Additionally, since each one of these tufts is particularly voluminous, I'll add cast shadows underneath to help demonstrate the form. Since the hatching's not only indicating volume, but lighting as well, I add more of it on my three side. I'll repeat the same process for the last two textures, first identifying some shapes and how I'm going to sketch them in, and then I'll utilize that texture to cover a cube, remembering that my light is coming from top left, and so we'll get cast shadows and a darker three side. Again, I prefer to lay in shapes and then add hatching onto those shapes afterward. I'm using hatching that goes towards the left and right vanishing points in this case to help indicate the tone. For feathers, it's important to capture their overlap, which is emphasized by the cast shadows of their forms. The flight feathers, which are towards the end of the wing, are longer and slimmer in shape compared to the rounder feathers at the top of the wing. To add some of the gradation that's found on each feather, I use patches of denser hatching to imitate that feather coloring. Drawing materials is a little bit different because they don't rely on large changes in the surface contour to affect the way light appears on its surface. Examining the glass bottle, we can see that there's a few things that will influence the way we draw it. For one, it's transparent, so we need to make sure that we indicate objects that are behind it. And two, you see darkest values near the silhouette edges, because at that point, you're looking through the maximum amount of material. And lastly, since it's reflective, you'll get strong highlights that interrupt what you see behind it. Also notice that in this bottle, we're seeing all four edges of the bottom plane. Polished armor will have strong highlights due to its specularity, but it tends to be more diffuse and spread out. The reflections are present, but again, they're going to be somewhat diffuse and they're a little bit difficult to see. 
Since the surface itself is pretty flat, I tend to use a hatching that just goes perpendicular to the orientation of the plane. But I make sure to leave those strong highlights that gradually taper out. Alright everyone, that's about it for this week. Try this out for yourselves by picking a list of textures and materials and then attempting to replicate them with your pencils. Try devising alternative methods for the same texture. A few updates. Since my last video, we reached 100,000 subscribers and we started a podcast. Every week, we'll be bringing you a new interview with creative professionals. It airs every Saturday at 12 p.m. Pacific time. And with that, thank you so much for sticking around to the end of the video. If you enjoyed what you saw, please like and subscribe and consider supporting the channel on Patreon. We have a lot of great options like the live stream archive, Gumroads at a discounted price, group lessons, and one-on-one -on -one lessons. Take care, everybody.